After working hard at the gym, you need a mattress that works as hard as you do. Spinaline has engineered the perfect mattress for you and your active lifestyle. Don't compromise your recovery with inferior sleep. Order your Spinaline mattress today. Workout Vape. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. Television on rxmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. I'm your host, Deke Faruqi. Glad you can join us as always. Anything and everything is on the table diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, of course, the competition season in full swing as we speak. And on that note, as we bring in Dave Palumbo, Dave, by the time this video goes up, we will have on our channel. Uh, your preview, more or less a reaction video to the New York Pro lineup being released yesterday. And you and I just talking off air a couple of minutes ago, we both agreed this is arguably, maybe easily, one of the deepest, if not the deepest lineup that the New York Pro has had in years. I mean, you look at the uh, the, the, the competitor sheet, Ian Vallier, John De La Rosa jump off the sheet immediately, Max Charles, uh, who had a sensational following at the Arl, and then you have... The wild card, you have Dwayne Walker, Dave, who just started at the Tampa Pro, Hassan Mustafa, Justin Rodriguez has been great at the New York Pro in previous years. Give the audience a primer of your reaction to this lineup. It's, it's deep, which means that we don't know who's going to win, which means that it's exciting for the fans and the press to watch these shows because it's not a foregone conclusion. I mean, John, I, in my reaction video uh, to this lineup, you'll see, I mean, John De La Rosa is the most accomplished, you know, guy in the lineup. He probably has the most pro wins. He's, you know, he's got to be considered the veteran. He really has no weaknesses, aside from the fact that he doesn't really sometimes nail his conditioning. When he's 100%, he's really tough to beat, you know, because he doesn't have any gaps and holes in his physique. And he's not going against Ruley Winkler here and, and Bonac, you know. He's going against the guys that he's, you know, his contemporaries who he can handle uh, in this lineup. Obviously, if, if Ian Valier puts it all together, I don't think he can be beat just because he's, he's bigger and he's a, he's, a, he's a bigger structure on stage. I think he'll look more impressive in the lineup, but we haven't seen him do that. You know, he's admitted you know, he's got some you know, uh, you know, anxiety issues about the whole thing. But you know what? The fact that he kind of bombed out at Tampa, even though he still plays second, uh, I think that's going to make him come back even better at this show. So I think we're going to see a really good Ian Valier. He'll be tough to beat. Obviously, Patrick Moore in this lineup, too, you didn't mention. And Quentin, yeah. and Quentin Aria, who is super impressive. Um, he's been impressing me ever since the, the last year and a half. The, the progress he's made is is mind-boggling. I think he's gained like 20-something pounds or, or maybe more. The, here's a guy with, with, with you know, freaky like Melvin Anthony structure, and I think that he's going to you know, surprise a lot of people. And, of course, if Hassan Mustafa can put it all together and bring the conditioning, he's another guy who's just got oodles and oodles of you know, Egyptian muscle on him. You know? <laughs> he, from, coming from that same school of, uh, of thought of Big Ramy, you know, he's got just billowy you know, muscle, no gaps in his physique, but we haven't seen him put the final touches on it yet and bring this stupendous conditioning. It's anyone's show. Justin Rodriguez is in this lineup, and he's dangerous. So it's exciting because we don't know who. I can't even. I couldn't even pull a top five out, and you know, and say for sure this is going to be it. Because 
invariably there's going to be some guys that are you know big names that are not at their best and then there's going to be guys that aren't such big names who are going to be at their best and they may sneak into that top five group because we unexpectedly because maybe some of the the, the name guys are a little off so it's a great lineup i think steve weinberg's got to be happy with this this uh this you know i hope you know the, the thing that stinks is we got a great lineup but we can't even have a, a crowd in 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 the audience there watching it so it is what it is but It'll be great for the fans. Hopefully, there'll be a nice live stream. I don't know what the deal is with that. I haven't really looked that up yet. I'm sure there will be one. And uh, we'll probably be you know, analyzing this show for the next you know, two weeks after because it's going to be so exciting because of all the different you know, types of physiques we have. And you remember, all these physiques are completely different. John De La Rosa to Ian Valier, I mean, those guys are about as diametrically different as you could possibly ask for, but yet they're both top-tier bodybuilders. So it's going to be a good, good New York pro. I mean, selfishly for me, uh, I was so looking forward to covering the show, obviously no longer in New York, now in Tampa. Dave, before we go to the questions, um, I don't know if you addressed this in the video or I don't know if anything was announced pertaining to the Olympia slots, similar to what we uh, were told about the uh, the show in Alicante, Spain, about two to three, um, the top two or three, depending on the division, are going to get Olympia berths. Is there anything like that that's going to apply to this New York problem? I haven't heard any changes announced. That doesn't mean that it can't happen uh, posthumously. But I think that's the right word. Um, but, <laughs> but I think that they're doing that in Europe, Sid, because there's only one show. Right. Whereas there's multiple shows in the U.S. So we might not see the you know three top three going to the Olympia in the U.S. at the New York Pro only because there are other shows still happening here. Right. You know, and I you know the Tampa. I mean, Chicago was moved, but it's going to be in. in um, in Atlanta. So we have more shows before the Olympia, whereas that show in Spain may be the only one. And so I yeah. think that's why they did that. Fair point. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions, of course, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. First question, Dave, have taken T3, T4 increases cellular metabolic rate. Would it stand to reason that taking it would also increase protein synthesis and thus serve to enhance muscular development? Taking extra thyroid hormone, okay, specifically T3 since that's active thyroid hormone, can potentially increase protein synthesis if you're a little low. If you're already at the max, you know, in other words, if you're at if you're if your levels are good already at, you know, high levels, you probably won't see an increase in protein synthesis from from taking extra T3. As a matter of fact, if you take too much, you could actually lo- you could actually eat up muscle because it's it's it increases metabolic rate too fast. However, however, you know, you got to remember that when you take T3, it's because you're trying to lose body fat. So it's by increasing metabolic rate, you're obviously increasing you know fat mobilization, carbohydrate utilization. If you're taking something that's protein sparing, like anabolic steroids with it or GH with it, you're going to spare the muscle tissue. So it's not really going to build more muscle, but it's going to certainly burn more fat. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, I'm really puzzled. I'm lean with a low carb diet, and no matter what I do, still have a lower abdominal bulge, hardly no sub Q fat. Would this be because of visceral fat? How can I get rid of it? It's really annoying. You know, having a, a distended lower stomach, you know, usually the lo- a lot of guys have upper stomachs. The lower stomach distension, usually, at least to me, that usually spells or smells, <laughs> no pun intended, of uh, not emptying your bowel properly, meaning that you probably need a fiber supplement. So adding a, a fiber supplement like Fiberlize, you know, twice a day will help get rid of that, that fecal matter that's kind of hanging out in there and, and distending your stomach. Now, can it also be visceral fat? Yeah, but usually visceral fat will, will, will be, you know, the entire, you know, the entire abdomen will be, because you got to remember, where visceral fat is accumulated is not necessarily it does go in between the organs and everything but there's a there's a layer called the omentum the greater omentum that covers the entire abdominal cavity and that's what gets fatty so it, it's, it wouldn't just be in one little pocket like that so to me that smells of um you know, once again another not not to be too gross smells of the fact that you're not getting rid of all your waste and so that could be a, a fiber issue so i would try to do that now these two questions came from the dave palumbo experience app this is an, an app that I offer. Um, you can get it from your iTunes store or Android store. It's all the writings I've ever done, all the videos I've ever done in one place, plus I do an exclusive Q&A uh, video every week just for the app members, and I answer everyone's questions. And I answer them in a public forum in the app so that everyone sees everyone's questions and answers. So it's kind of like a learning experience. 
We put up a workout every single week there you can follow. It, it's, a great, it's a great resource to have at your fingertips or in your pocket. Uh, you can read it when you're on the toilet. You can do, it pretty much is right there. You always have the ability to ask me questions and I will answer them, like I said, in a public forum on the app. The best questions get answered in a video format, which goes up once a week. So for 29 bucks a month, you're getting a lot of value and a lot of people are really enjoying it. You might wanna just check it out. We give the first 10 days for free, so you can try it, no obligations. If you like it, you continue, just keep going with it. If you don't, you can cancel and it's uh, no obligations there. Let's go to our Instagram questions. If you're, again, if you're not following us, it's under, official underscore RX Muscle. And if you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button. Give us a comment, obviously. It helps us. And as always, we appreciate your support. Um, first question is about someone who we thought we were going to see at the New York Pro. I'm not sure, Dave, if you address this in your video. Evan Santopani, not on the competitor list, so presumably not competing. Yeah. So the question is from John Walter. Is Evan Santapani making a mistake not competing this year? You know, I don't even know why he's not competing, to be honest. I probably should have reached out to him because we were talking about him as a potential guy that can do really some damage in this lineup on Heavy Muscle Radio earlier this week before the competitor list was released. I had texted Steve Weinberg and I said, who's competing? And he said, gave me some of the guys. And then he said, you know, uh, Evan Santapani might compete. And I don't, so I don't know why he decided not to. Obviously, if, he, if, if there was a might there, that means that he, he had been dieting, preparing for the show, and maybe he just felt he wasn't ready. So maybe we're going to see him in Chicago, which would really be in Atlanta, obviously, because that's where that show is going to take place. Maybe he just needed more time. Remember, he did come back from a quad, you know, um, tear a couple years ago, and this will be his first show back. So, you know, maybe it was a good idea to skip it for Evan because it is a tough lineup here. Um, there's a, it is stacked to the hilt. Maybe going for the next one might be a better option if he's looking to qualify for the Olympia. Let's go to Jimmy Power 66. Is there a huge difference in terms of muscle activation between the lying T-bar row and a normal T-bar row uh, or a T-bar row using the V-handle as a grip? I like all of them, but don't know if one is better than the other. You know what the right answer to that question is? There's no right answer. And then the, the, the fact is that you have to use the handle and position that you feel the most activation of your back. You know, when I would do pull downs, you know, I see a lot of guys going really wide grip pulling down. And you know what? I, I kind of didn't feel it that much in my lats. You know, and I couldn't go heavy enough really to get a good pull. And I saw a video Dorian Yates did where he said, you know, the best, you know, hand position on pull downs is a closer grip because you're stronger when your arms are closer to your body. And you know what? That's probably the case for guys with long arms like Dorian and like me. And I, so I, I tried it and I, and I noticed much better results. But I see guys that have shorter arms that go really wide. And for them, it's fine because they don't have a long, their, their arm isn't reaching out to the, to the very ends of the bar. So you got you to gotta use positions and handles that you feel in the muscle that you're trying to work the best. You can't take my advice because I have a different you know, framework and, and the biomechanics than say a different guy with shorter arms and might be a little shorter in height. You got to do what works for you. So the right answer is try out all the different positions, find what works best for you, and then stick with that. And obviously, it's a good idea to throw different positions in every once in a while, but you'll know what, what the meat and potatoes of what you're, you need to do is. Um, I always found that, you know, um, you know, I was able to do reverse grip bent over rows as well as overhands, okay? I do overhands now because I'm not looking to tear a bicep, but, you know, but it didn't bother me. Some guys, they, they don't have the flexibility to, to supinate their hands all the way to do that position. So they're stuck like this. And it, so it never really felt good for them to do that. So they shouldn't do reverse grips. They should just do overhand grips. And so you got to find what works for your body. Let's go to JJ Fitness. Dave, your opinion on the belief that tight myofascia is a limiting factor in overall muscle growth. You know, that was, a, that was a, a theory put forth, or probably by many people, but, but John Perillo was a big, you know, myofascial stretching guy. You know, he felt that he had to do like this brutal stretching techniques to really stretch that fascia to allow the muscle to expand and grow. And, you know, and that, and that was the, for a long time, that was the theory of how muscles grew. Like they would, like in other words, the growth was limited by how much the fascia would, ex, would expand. And I just don't, you know, it made sense at the time, you know, but it's just not the case. Um, you know, the muscle will find a way to expand if it wants to grow. If not, you'll just feel very tight fascial sheets around them. I mean, there's people that get what's called anterior compartment syndrome in their lower leg. 
because their calf muscles get so big and, the, and, the, and, the, and that, that fascia can't stretch. But the calf doesn't stop growing. It just gets bigger and then that fascia gets so tight they have to actually go in there and surgically open it up a little bit, slice it open. So I don't think that that's the case. Having said that, however, I think stretching is good for flexibility purposes to get full range of motion when you're doing it. Because I see a lot of guys, they, they do partial range of motion, and, and I've asked guys in the gym, why are you doing that? And they're like, I can't go down any further. I can't. They literally are stuck because they're not stretching enough. So there, there is a definite benefit to stretching, you know, once the muscle's warmed up, of course, never stretch cold. And getting that muscle so it's I remember toward the end of my career, you know, I really would have to stretch, do a little warm-up and stretch before I did legs if I wanted to really get a full range of motion and, and move fluently where I was all stiff, you know. And I think that was a lot to do with because I was sitting a lot at a computer desk and I was getting all cramped up in it. And it's funny, the last couple of days I was I've been walking around like I'm 90 years old because everything's stiff. And I went in the pool the other day, did a couple laps and was swimming. And the next day I felt like, I thought I was gonna be sore from that. I was actually, I felt better the next day because I was loose all, I loosened up all those muscles. Um, sometimes sitting for too long is not necessarily a good thing. Let's go to M. Nikzewski. We've gotten these questions before, but uh, new audiences like to get them back into the mix. Uh, your opinion on artificial sweeteners such as Splenda during prep. Some people say it makes your stomach look bloated on stage. I haven't really noticed any um, abdominal issues from, from that. However, having said that, I, I will preface it by saying that some people have, are more sensitive to artificial sweeteners than others. In some situations, some people's guts, you know, they're back, the bacteria of the gut ferment these things and they produce gas from it. So if you're a person that, that doesn't do well with artificial sweeteners and you get gassy and, and bloated from it, then don't use them. You know, cut them out a couple days before the show. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, and go to water, you know, it's fine. But if you can get away with drinking diet sodas and diet drinks and it doesn't bother your stomach, and then stick with that. I, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, you know. You have to kind of experiment, you know, because once again, everyone is different. You got to remember, the, 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 the gut bacteria ferment, you know, uh, prebiotic, you know, fibers, meaning that like, you know, inulin fiber, which is in stevia balance, um, even just, just regular fiber supplements in general, they eat this stuff, that's what they do. And the way they eat is they ferment it. And sometimes some people, when there's a lot of fermentation going on, there is gas production. But usually usually it reduces that because what it's doing is it's, it's helping to move the, uh, the you know, a fiber supplement will also move all the fecal waste out of the body quicker. So everyone's different, you know, and everyone responds to things differently. And you have to do some trial and error. That's why you never experiment with something new like the week of a show. It's ridiculous. If you haven't been doing it all along, don't add it in last week, okay? And, and, and then, you know, cross your fingers that it's going to work. That's not the way to do it. You experiment ahead of time. You take notes and observations to see how your body responds to different things. Diet soda, can I drink it? Yeah, okay, great. If I can't drink it, it does blow up my stomach, then I got to cut it out a week before the show. And that's all there is, you know, that's how you go about it. Perhaps a philosophical question here. Uh, it's, I don't, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. Dave, one question, why is it hard to grow without the use of gear? Once you've touched it, it seems like you've been wasting your time with hard dieting and working out. Why is such a massive difference? Recovery, strength, the adding size, simple diet work ethic means nothing without the gear. And without the work or the diet, the gear is nothing. He goes, in conclusion, bodybuilding is the hardest sport out there. It is the hardest sport out there because it's, it's, a, it's a accumulation of all these variables together. But if you don't have diet and training and, and, re and sleeping down properly, then, then you could take all the gear you want. It's not going to do anything. We all know that. So the gear is just makes things work better. You know, it's kind of like an enhancer. Uh, so the problem is that no one gets the other variables down pat. And then they take gear and they get so-so results from it. You know, you take gear, everyone's going to grow from that, okay, to a certain degree. But how much you grow and the benefits you get, okay, from it are really dependent on the other variables. You know, when I took my first cycle, my diet was perfect, my training was perfect. I, I, I responded so well. You know, I was gaining 25 pounds, you know, 20 to 25 pounds a year of muscle for, the, for five years in a row. There was a reason, because I had all the variables perfected before I ever took gear. Okay, had I taken gear and I didn't have these variables perfected, I probably wouldn't have made those kind of gains. And that's, that's an important thing to understand. Now, having said that, I made very good gains the first couple years, I, the first four or five years that I was training, okay, without gear. 
just by learning to eat right and train right. So if I would have taken gear then, I would have been wasting my time because I would have been using the gear to grow. And then when I actually needed the gear, it wouldn't be there. And that's why you got guys like Ronnie Coleman who were natural for many years. They started taking gear and their bodies exploded because they, they had maximized, he had maximized his ability to train. He trained heavy. He, you know, he ate right. He lived the bodybuilding lifestyle. It didn't matter that he wasn't on drugs. So when he added those in, it just made everything work better. Another person that comes to mind, Kai Green, responded incredibly as well. Um, same thing. Same thing. Look at Sean Clarita. Look at the, the 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 gains he's made the past three or four years. He was a natural bodybuilder too. So you got to understand that the the gear is not that important until you hit a point where you've maximized everything you could have done prior to that, and then you add it in, and you get that added benefit of of really getting explosive growth from it. Let's go to Nick Wallen 66. What changes do you think Flex Lewis will need to make to be his absolute best going from 212 to the Open this coming Olympia? I don't think he has to make any changes. I think now he just doesn't have to drop as much weight. I mean, think about it. The guy was probably in shape, you know, six weeks out from the Olympia, and then he had to try to figure a way to make weight, which is basically lose muscle, over dehydrate yourself. Nothing, nothing dumber to do, for, you know, for a bodybuilding, you know, show than to lose muscle and, and over, over deplete yourself. But if that's the only way you can make weight, then that's the only way you can make weight. So I think if he comes in now, um, at his natural weight, you know, which is whatever it's been up, I don't know what he's up to now. You know, we're gonna see a, a much better Flex Lewis. We're gonna see a, a much more round, freaky, grainy, you know, Flex Lewis. He might not be that much bigger. You know, people think, oh, he's gonna be twenty pounds. At, he might not be. He, if he was 212 at the 212 Olympia the last time he competed two years ago, he might be 222, which is 10 pounds. But you know what? He probably sucked down eight or eight to 10 pounds. He might be what he was had he not had to suck down, only in better shape. And so that would be a devastating look with his frame, his height, and his muscle bellies. So I'm excited. I think a big mistake that he could make is that he tries to come in too big and doesn't bring that same brain. But I know Flex and I know Neil Hill, they're not gonna make that, that, that's an amateur mistake to make. He's gonna come in just as good as he was conditioning wise at all his Olympias, except he's gonna be bigger. And that's gonna be deadly. That's a deadly combination for him. It's gonna be exciting for everyone. I remember we've been debating this topic since I believe 2014, 2015, that you know, when the rumors started that he was considering it, uh, finally, now is going to come to a reality in a matter of three and a half months. So let's go to Benny Nats. Ivan, do you burn a lot of fat in between back-to-back -back shows when you're not doing cardio, but you're depleting, depleting hard and carving up and cheating post-show? You know, I, I think you do. I think you get a, a rebound. I, I, you know, have had people do shows and then I feed them more. I do give them less cardio and they continue to lose fat somehow because I think they're, it's like their metabolisms are in overdrive. And it's good to take advantage of that. The problem is that a lot of people will be afraid to eat more because they think, well, I got another show coming up in two weeks. I got to train even harder. To, you know? Now, you only do that if you need to get leaner. But if you're in shape for the first show, you have to actually eat more, do less cardio, cut back your fat burners a little bit. Otherwise, you risk coming in too depleted and too flat, and you won't be able to recover from that. And that's... You know, I'm working with, you know, with uh, Phil Klahars in that situation now. I mean, I'm giving him, <laughs> if you saw the food I'm giving him this past week or so, he's eating a lot, you know, he's eating like burgers and fries every night because I, I got to keep this guy full. You know, he, his metabolism is just cranking away. And that, you know, you got to do what you got to do, you know, to, to, to ignore that. And if I would have kept just training him harder and harder and pushing him more and more and more, he would have just come in small and depleted. And that's not the look you're looking for. So you have to understand that after the, doing your first show, Look for that metabolic, you know, increase. It, it, it happens every time. Let's go to Neil Zalewski, who has a <clears throat> perhaps a new nickname for you, calls you Dave the Dentist Killer. Now, is that something that we could potentially put on a shirt? I don't know. I guess so. Why am I the Dentist Killer? You don't remember the story from two weeks ago? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm losing my mind. I, I don't sleep. If you don't sleep, you don't, you don't solidify memories, uh, Sid. <laughs> um, I, you know, to be honest with you, I was supposed to go this Monday and pick up the, uh, the mouth guard that, that he made for me, the third one. And I actually, I think I subconsciously overslept on purpose. I completely forgot about the appointment. And I knew, I knew the night before, I said, I got to go to the dentist in the morning. And I, and I just... I just didn't get up, and I, and I didn't even think about it. And I saw they, I saw they left a message, and I purposely didn't call them back because I'm kind of giving them like I'm like, ah, you know what? Let them, 
let him let him hold on to the, the night guard a little bit, even though I paid for it already, you know. Because at this point, what's the difference? I already waited all this time. I'm, you know, I'd rather get a couple extra hours sleep than, than be exhausted for the day. Because I already know what's going to happen. I'm going to go back there. It's not going to fit me again. And they're going to have to make it again. And I'm going to go nuts and do a crazy rant, even worse than the last one. So I figured I might as well at least be well rested when I'm going to do my rant. <laughs> So his question is, does EQ lower estrogen or is it bro science? The only study I found is showed that the, meta uh, the metabolites of EQ can act like an AI, but that's one study. What have you seen in your experience? I don't think e EQ acts like an, uh, an aromatase inhibitor at all. No, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't noticed it empirically at all. Uh, we know Masteron can act like an estrogen receptor antagonist. Um, we know it can actually um, do that. So, but that's pretty well documented. You can tell you get a little drier on, on, on Masteron. Haven't noticed that on EQ. I think if, if, it, if that was the case, a lot of people would probably take it right up to a show. And you probably could. You probably could do test an EQ up to a show if you had to. I, I knew people in the past that did it like that. Not at the dosages guys take today, but you could. But it's, it seems to be more of an off-season you know, stack or at least in the, maybe like the first eight weeks of contest prep guys will use test an EQ. Uh, to get started, but then then that seems to be a drug most people pull um, the last six to eight weeks. So I would say no. Let's go. We'll take three more questions. Let's go to Classic Physique Nash. I already eat plenty of chicken, beef, eggs, and rice and still struggle to put on mass. My question is, what are some cheap quality foods to bump up my total daily protein, fat, and calorie intake? I may come across the homework sign, but I guess in general – when you have a situation like that, somebody who's struggling to put off a mask, what would your guidelines be? And, and it seems like it's a financial issue. He wants to go cheap. That's what I mean. That's what I'm getting at. He wants that, cheap. Yeah, yeah. Look, when I was when I had no money and I was in school, and I would I would I would I would go and get the cheapest. Whenever they have sales on tuna, I would go and buy cases of the stuff. And I used so much tuna and, and white minute rice. I can't tell you how much of that I ate. Nowadays, what I would do is I would, I would, back then I was eating peanuts with it, but you know, peanuts is not really a great source of fat. I would buy like a couple, like a case of my macadamia nut oil, which is very reasonably priced, and I would just be pouring mac oil into my rice and tuna and just be eating that all day long. That, that, I mean, that, that's like, my father would call that poverty food, but he said, yeah, I don't understand why you like poverty food, you know, because that, that's, I always like, you know, dried out, you know, stuff and, you know, I always ate the, the cuts of meat that my father would consider the stuff they ate when he was during the depression, you know. Uh, I never ate, I didn't like fatty cuts of meat. I just wasn't into like the whole, you know, prime rib and that kind of stuff and sirloin steaks that had fat hanging off them. I was more of a, like a, a top round, you know, London broil, which is a really lean cut. A lot of people don't like it because it's a little tougher. But that's just me, you know. I, I, that's, and and I, I find that I, you know, I did well with that. But, you know, now I know, knowing what I know about fats now, I would, like I said, I would be pouring macadamia nut oil, um, maybe buying some avocados, you know, to mix in there, and rice, tuna, and, and fats. I mean, come on, man, do it. I mean, that's the easiest. They even have canned chicken now. Uh, if you go to, like, Ma uh, Sam's Club, which is, like, a price club, they have, like, you know, I buy, I know Amanda likes it. We buy, like, uh, they're, they're, they're in cans. They almost look like tuna, only it's chicken. So you, you, you might want to switch around. So if you want to do chicken you can, one day, you can do uh, tuna another day. It's, it's relatively cheap, too. It comes in big cans, and you can eat that all day long. I mean, there's no, there's no excuse why you can't get enough protein if you go and use the, go the canned chicken or canned tuna route and just buy some cheap minute rice. Big, you could buy big bags of it. it. cooks in like a couple of minutes in the microwave. It's so simple, and then you have a, some oil or you have a bag of nuts or almonds or walnuts or, you know, and, or just use, like, a, like I said, get a nice bottle of oil or macadamia nuts even, you know, are pretty good. But... I like the oils because they kind of mix into the food real easy. I used to have like these big Tupperware containers where I'd put tuna, rice, and, and usually pour some. At, at that time, there was no mac oil. We would pour olive oil over it. And that's what I would eat all day long, and it was, it was delicious. I didn't care. Uh, Tom, for a couple of more questions, let's go to Shad Water Fit. I've always heard that taking GH and insulin at the same time can be counterproductive. What is the science behind this? Is this related to blood sugar levels in different ways with each hormone? When is the best time to take apart from each other if this is the case? They don't compete with each other essentially, but usually in, in the natural state, when you have your insulin levels are high, GH levels are low, and when GH levels are high, <clears throat> insulin levels are low. So they work antagonistically to each other naturally in the body. 
However, if you put them into the body at the same time, they will synergize each other, believe it or not. So there's nothing wrong with taking them together. I used to take my insulin shot with my GH in the morning because the insulin will override the, um, <clears throat> the GH's effect of, being, of creating an insulin resistance in the body. So that's, that's a good thing, you know. So it'll enable you to absorb your food, but yet still get the growth effect from the, from the growth hormone. So there's nothing wrong with taking them at the same time because you're taking two exogenous hormones. You're not trying to release them from the body. You're actually taking the hormone and putting it in there. And that's a big difference. Now, if you were trying to say, oh, I'm gonna take this amino acid to try to make my body release GH, and I'm gonna to try to take this other you know, uh, food to try to cause G uh, insulin surge, now you're having to worry about, well, can I do both at the same time? Maybe not. But when you're actually injecting the actual hormone, it doesn't matter. Last question it is from N Breuer 31 and this is something you've spoken about before in terms of that dark place that you have to go when you're training heavy, super, super heavy. Dave, is it normal to be so intense when training that you get really nervous before every time you go to the gym and when at the gym going into a quote, really dark place to be able to get under the really heavy weights? Yeah, I, I um, I would be thinking, when I would do legs, I would think about that workout all day long. It was, it was terrible. It was like, oh, leg day, oh, oh, I'm gonna have to do legs. And it wasn't that I loved legs, because I loved the feeling of it, I liked the, the, the progress I made, but I knew it was gonna be a very, very uncomfortable workout. I knew that I was gonna be putting weight on my back that I wasn't comfortable with doing myself. I was gonna need a spotter that I trusted there with me. I knew that it was going to be an uncomfortable day, but it was okay because that's, that's what I was putting all my effort into. And so I would go rehearse the workout in my mind a little bit throughout the day, uh, thinking about what I needed to do, how I was going to eat to prepare for the workout, you know, what I was going to put into my stomach pre-workout so that I wouldn't throw up, you know, or get nauseous. Usually it was a shake that usually sat well in my stomach. And when I got into the gym, you know, it was, it was all work, you know, and of course the first couple of sets, you know, the only real bad set is the last one. The, the sets you know you can do, the weight, because you've done it before, is not a big deal. It's when you get to that last set where you're going to have to wrap your knees, get that belt on perfect, you have to talk to your training partner, hey, you got to have to watch me here, uh, watch me on the way down, you know, whatever you, you know, this might be a weight that you've never really executed, you know, you know or, or either that or maybe you're going for more reps than you've ever done, and you want to make sure that if you get stuck that this, this training partner is going to get you up, Okay. And you know that your nervous system is going to get traumatized from all that weight you're going to have on your back. But, but this is what you're doing and you're laying on the line because you want to make your legs better than they were the last time. You want to improve on stage. So you have to get into that mindset of, look, I got to challenge myself every time I'm in the gym. Whether it's one more rep or a little more weight or more intensity, whatever it was, I was always trying to push. And so that made the workouts you know, a little more stressful in the sense that I felt that I had, if I left the gym and I didn't get 100% out of what I was looking for when I got in there, I felt like I failed, which wasn't always a failure, because sometimes you know you get a little twinge, you hurt yourself, and you would get a little depressed from that, not having the best workout. But then there were times you got in there and you, you did everything right, and you hit those weights you wanted, and man, you felt so good when you left that gym, because you knew you put, you, you left nothing on the table. And that's, that's what bodybuilding is all about, at the most competitive level. You know, at the level I'm at now where I just want to look good and feel good, I don't, I'm not trying to set any records. I have no stress. I go into my, my weight room upstairs in my house and I, I knock out my workout and it's not a big deal because I'm not trying to set records. I'm, I'm lifting weights I know I can easily handle. I'm just stimulating the muscle to feel good. So there's a big difference between taking it, you know, and pushing your body to the ultimate limit to be the best that you can be versus just going into the gym and having fun and, and being healthy. So, you know, it depends on what your goals are. And that does it for this episode of Ask Dave. Reminder, right now on RxMuscle.com, the Rx Muscle YouTube channel, Dave's reaction video to the New York Pro lineup released last night. Uh, Dave lays out the entire lineup in his opinion, my opinion, and many opinion. It is the deepest lineup the New York Pro has had in many years. For Dave Palumbo and our producer, Tyler Shore, I'm Sadiq Farouki. We'll see you next time.